In our study today, we're going to tackle a difficult question, and that question and this broadcast will be focused upon what does the Bible say about alcohol and social drinking? This is Tiff Shuttlesworth. Until this tweet was shared with me, I had never heard of him. I found this worth addressing because the pastor at a church I attended in Copper's Cove, Texas, in 1983, made such an ass of himself over this issue, it made the newspaper in the larger nearby town of Colleen. I was so embarrassed by his behavior that my husband and I left the church. At the time, Copper's Cove was a dry town, which it continued to be until 2017. Restaurants could sell alcohol only if they were licensed as a private club. Anytime a restaurant applied for a club license, he was at the city hall to oppose it and educate everyone on the evils of alcohol. So grab a glass of wine for this one and let's have a chat. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me and especially to my patrons and channel members. Mm. I began by looking up who Tiff is. Here's his page uh. on his channel. I notice his education is conspicuously absent. Here's his website. He graduated from North Point Bible College and Seminary. No indication of what his degree is in and no indication of any postgraduate study. Most interesting, he is now the president of the college. With no advanced degree? That's weird for an accredited academic institution. Here's its rating with EduRank. It didn't even make the U.S. News & World Report listings. It does have several faculty members with advanced degrees. But we digress. Let's talk about wine. There is much debate uh, among Christians on both sides of this equation when it comes to alcohol and wine and beer and social drinking. And I'm sure that there are multitudes that will watch this uh, time of study and you'll either be on one side of that equation or the other. No, duh. And there are over 200 passages in the Bible that deal with alcohol and wine and drinking and so on. Let's fact check that. According to Bible Hub, this word for wine is used four times, this Hebrew word 141 times, this Hebrew word for strong drink 23 times, this Greek word for drunkenness three times, and this Hebrew word for a drunken man 13 times. I found different Greek and Hebrew words for of wine, oil and wine, wine cask, and wine skin, so it's difficult to determine just how many passages reference wine, strong drink, or drunkenness, but it does seem to be more than I expected. However, when I checked my Strong's exhaustive concordance, I found about 200 verses that mention wine, and another 300 for drink, and about 50 each for drunken drunkenness, so he's right. There are over 200 passages that mention alcohol. Got that one right. When it comes to matters of doctrine and faith and conduct, they have to be answered not just by the Bible, by the proper interpretation of the Bible. And what makes your interpretation the right one? Don't hold your breath. He's not going to answer that. And never by our preconceived biases, by personal experiences, by secular standards, or even by misguided individuals who call themselves Christian ministers. So we have another Christian who says one can't determine who is a Christian by self-identification. There are real Christians and fake Christians. You only had a handful of teachers that, that taught you math. You only had a handful of teachers that taught you science social studies, geography, and so on. He's talking about why if you are a dedicated student of the Bible, you need trusted teachers. I included this because I checked the academic classes offered by his college, and there are scant few in any of those areas. 
it's interesting that he lists academic subjects that one needs teachers for, and then is president of a college that offers almost no instruction in any of those subjects. There is one course in biology to help students develop a biblical view on science, and there are a couple classes in psychology and history. With that said, we're going to answer three questions. If you're taking notes, question number one. Was the wine and alcohol in biblical times comparable to the wine and alcohol of today? I first encountered this issue as an undergraduate when a chemistry professor said in a lecture that believers who claim that Jesus didn't drink are wrong because before modern refrigeration, all grape juice fermented if it was kept more than for a few hours. This baffled me as I had never heard that claim. Later, when I attended the Baptist church I referred to in the opening, I then heard it. Jesus only drank grape juice, never wine. The wine at the wedding at Cana was really grape juice. Fortunately, I never fell for that one, as the chem prof had already armed me with the knowledge that that was poppycock. He might have even said bullshit. I'm not sure. I can't remember that far back. Is Tiff going to try to rejuvenate that claim that I thought had died long ago? Any Christian or biblical discussion on the use of alcohol must understand that there was a significant difference between the alcohol and the wine and the drinks that were used in the Bible and the wine and the alcohol that we have in our modern society. Let me share with you just a few of the significant differences. And again, if you're taking notes, you can write them down. Can I really? Are you giving us permission? Or are you reminding your viewers that you are able to write? Do you think that you could get much more condescending? Major significances between the wine and alcohol of biblical times compared to the wine and alcohol of today. Significant reason number one, wine of the biblical era had a much lower alcohol content. He likely gets that claim from this website from Faith and Culture, put out by Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. No sources for the claim, but there is some truth to it, as wine would primarily have been naturally fermented then. On top of that, wine was often watered down. In biblical times, the best wines came from China, Egypt, Iran, and Armenia, according to the blog Usual Wines. In Jesus' time, the Romans advanced winemaking by using barrels to hasten the fermenting process and reduce the cost. Romans also added using a wine press to crush the grapes and separate the skins. This device is even mentioned in the Bible. Wine was part of daily life for Romans and was easily accessible for rich and poor alike. Lower quality wines were mixed with vinegar, honey, or the bitter leftover grape components after pressing. There is truth to his claim. Most sites that discuss the subject are religious ones, but this secular one agrees. The process used then produced a less potent wine. Wine and alcohol in biblical and ancient times had a much lower alcohol content. Why did he find it necessary to repeat that? Does he think his audience will disagree the first time he says it, but be convinced if he says it again? He's not wrong, but if he wanted to convince me, he should be supporting his claim with sources that discuss the ancient processes. The only reason I'm convinced is I did the research to support his claim. Dude, maybe do your own work next time. Wines in biblical times are estimated to have been from, uh, and there's variances, obviously. It's why the Bible talks about uh, various uh, levels of, of wine and alcohol in the Bible. Let me give you an example of that. In the Old Testament, there are 11 Hebrew words that we translate as wine and alcohol in a modern English Bible. That's right. In the Old Testament, there are 11 different Hebrew words that are just translated in a modern Bible as wine or alcohol or drink. And again, he makes claims that are correct, but the only reason I know that is I looked it up. 
Does he expect his audience to just take his word for it? Does he expect that they will believe him because he has the title pastor? Unfortunately, that often happens. I love that modern kids have cell phones with internet connections, so you can fact check the pastor during the sermon. They don't have to wait until they get home like I did. And so you understanding what I'm about to teach you is significant in the debate of alcohol and social drinking in the modern church. Think he could get much more condescending? I'm baffled that he's so popular. Wine in biblical times was commonly, as far as alcoholic content, 7 to 10 percent. True, that was common, according to Bad Ancient. Better wines were 15 percent and the best wines were 18 percent alcohol. Modern wines range from 5.5 percent to 25 percent, with fortified wines having a higher alcohol content and unfortified wines ranging from 5.5 to 18 percent, with an average of 11 percent. Wow, that sure is a significant difference. 5 to 18 percent as opposed to 5.5 to 18 percent. Do you think he bothered to look up the alcohol content of modern wines in writing this sermon? The wine that they used most commonly uh, for family consumption at meals was 7 to 10 percent in alcoholic content. Okay, so about the same as modern, naturally fermented wines. A fortified wine has brandy or other distilled spirits added to it. Wine is about the same today as it was then. So what's the point? Now, the other thing that you need to understand is that wine was not usually shared at a meal in that natural state. Uh, by contrast, modern breweries and distilleries produce table wines, fortified wines, hard liquors that are minimally around 14 percent, oftentimes 18 to 24 percent, uh, harder drinks 40 to 50 percent, and where I was born in West Virginia where they make their own moonshine and other parts of the world, uh, it's far beyond 40 to 50 percent uh, proof. So he does have the numbers. Interesting how he shades the truth a bit though. He talks about the alcohol content of fortified wines as if they were common table wines, which they are not, and then compares those to harder distilled spirits, which I didn't think was the topic at hand. Jesus drank wine. He made wine at the wedding at Cana. The Bible has several stories about people being drunk. If there really wasn't any alcohol in ancient times, or it was such a small amount, why is there any warning in the Bible to avoid strong drink if there was no such thing as strong drink? Uh, number two, ancient wine, as I already mentioned, commonly was somewhere around 7 plus percent in alcoholic content. But they didn't drink it straight. It was always, hear me, it was always diluted with water. This is true, but one needs to take into account how often wine was consumed. A little wine was added to the water one drank throughout the day, partly because it was a significant source of calories, and partly for taste. It could also have the effect of purifying the water, but that would not have been known. Wine was watered down at feasts to allow people to keep their wits through the long evening of drinking. Wine was often served full strength with water on the side so the guests could decide how much water to add. So he's not wrong, but when you consider people often drank wine all day, not just a glass or two with dinner, it's no wonder they had to water it down. Ancient wine was diluted before consumption. Write that down. Oh brother, is there going to be a test on this or something? Drinking unmixed wine that was not diluted, forget the Christian culture, the Jewish culture, the secular Greeks in their ancient writings wrote about it being barbaric to drink wine that had not been diluted with water. Again, he's not wrong. It was the socially accepted custom. The common average was three to one. Three parts water, 
one part wine, that wine being around 7% or so in alcoholic content, when it was mixed three parts water, you can see that it would have been almost impossible to be inebriated or intoxicated by drinking uh, even several glasses of that with a meal. If that was the case, why are there admonitions in the Bible to be not drunk with wine? Why then was Noah passed out drunk in his tent shortly after the flood? This claim puts a completely new spin on the story of Lot and his daughters. In Genesis 19, 30-38, Lot's daughters plot to get their father drunk with wine and then get pregnant by him, as they have no husbands, and God just killed all of their suitors when he rained fire and brimstone on Sodom, the town that they came from. If Tiff is right and it's nearly impossible to get drunk, let alone pass out drunk from the wine Lot was served by his daughters, then the fault here is not with the daughters, as the Bible claims. Lot must have been pretending to be drunk so he could sleep with his daughters. Maybe he lost his mistress in the blaze, too. Maybe he missed the town prostitutes, which were legal for him. But for whatever reason, Lot pretends to be drunk because Tiff here says he couldn't possibly be drunk from the wine that his daughters gave him, and he slept with them and impregnated his daughters. Good job, Tiff. You convinced us that no one in the Bible was ever really drunk, so Lot just got into incest because he had the hots for his daughters. And how about the story of Noah in Genesis 9? Now that has a dark plot twist. Noah only pretends to be drunk because drunkenness isn't a thing. And then he exposes himself to his sons and then curses the one who sees him. Ham then did nothing wrong except be in the wrong place at the wrong time. What's more, why is there a word for drunkenness if there is no such thing as drunkenness? Why does the Bible admonish people not to be drunk with wine if being drunk with wine wasn't even possible? Maybe the Bible was inspired by a God that knew alcohol distillation would later become a thing, and this was a warning for future generations? Okay, but why is there even a word to describe being drunk? Even a reference in Proverbs about a drunken person vomiting, if this isn't a thing. When you are reading about wine in the Bible, most often, now again, 11 Hebrew words, 5 Greek words, 16 different original language from original manuscript words that are typically only translated as wine or fresh wine or new wine or strong drink in the Bible. And so our modern English Bible does not really give us the depth of understanding as to what was being consumed in a casual reading of Scripture. So now we can't even know what the Bible means about this, just from reading the text. We need someone like Tiff here to discern it for us, because if we don't have someone like Tiff here to tell us what it's supposed to mean, we might end up thinking the Bible means what it says at a plain reading. I mean, it's not like God wants to be found. It's not like God wants people to believe the truth or that there's anything else at stake for failure to understand it, right? Tiff is right about another thing. His audience probably does need to be talked down to like this, if they're going to swallow this. And not come out wondering why God would do such a bad job of getting his Bible written that one needs someone like this to interpret it for them. The common wine most referenced in the Bible was only two, after dilution, two to two and three quarters percent alcohol. Now, by our own modern standards, to be a legal alcoholic beverage, it has to be 3.2 percent or higher. And so that's why you have things like near beer and non-alcoholic wines, etc. As long as a uh, company producing beverages keeps the alcoholic content under 3.2 percent, they don't have to even legally call it alcohol. I'm getting tired of cutting out all the times that he repeats himself. You're welcome. So his point is technically there was no alcohol in Bible times. Okay, were people getting drunk on non-alcoholic beverages or not getting drunk and the Bible is just wrong when it claims that they were drunk? 
If the latter, why did Lot rape his daughters, and why did the Genesis authors blame his incest on the women? The distillation process for liquors had not even been invented, let alone developed. This claim is false. The Chinese were distilling rice beverages in 800 BCE. The Romans produced a distilled beverage, although no references are found in writings about it before 100 CE. Production of distilled spirits was reported in Britain before the Roman conquest. He's right that it wasn't common in Europe before the Middle Ages, but he's wrong that it wasn't invented. Uh, distillation that produces modern alcoholic beverages with an alcohol content of 40% and, and much higher was not even invented until the Middle Ages. That's a different claim entirely. Distillation with the use of a coiled tube was not invented until the Middle Ages. The use of the coiled cooling tube allowed for distillation of even stronger beverages. He's missing the nuances here, not surprising when his audience needs to be reminded that they know how to write. The significant differences between the wine and alcohol discussed in the Bible and comparing it to modern times. So when ministers or pastors or, or teachers open up the Bible and they're trying to make an argument for drinking alcohol in moderation, if they're not discussing the radical differences between the wine and the alcohol of biblical times compared to modern times, then you're missing a significant part of the application of their teaching. Oh, I get it. Shots are bad. They didn't have shots in Bible time. But mixed drinks are fine. They mix their drinks in Bible time, so we need to drink mixed drinks. Guess I should have brought a martini instead of a glass of wine. Wait, just a minute. I'll be right back. There! Now I'm being biblical. I have a martini. Seriously, though, why should we care? Is the point to live like people in Bible times? If so, why are you on YouTube? They didn't have YouTube in Bible times. Why are you wearing those clothes? They didn't have those in Bible times, for that matter. Why do you have a Bible? They didn't have those in Bible times either. Because you're not comparing apples to apples. You're comparing two things that are worlds apart. Yes, I'm comparing wine to martinis. This one is a chocolate martini, by the way. Mmm, such a biblical drink. Fourthly, diluted wine was necessary in biblical times. Uh, it was not just a matter of pleasure or, or for festivals. Wine was necessary in their culture. Why? Because, again, of the primitive nature of, of flowing water and sewage and the dispersing of sewage in villages and towns and communities, etc., water sources were always polluted. And so they had problems with uh, common bacteria and parasites, and, and uh, we don't have to deal with that. Even though our, our modern water that comes through our faucets and through our taps is maybe not the healthiest water on the face of the earth. It has been infused with various chemicals and chlorine and, and various fluoride. I mean, depending on the city where you're at, the water that comes through your tap has been uh, in an attempt to be made as safe as possible. And in most towns and communities and major cities in America, you can drink water out of the tap without having a health risk. Now that's not so when you go to many countries, but many people from America and from North America who have gone on vacation, and not the third world countries, they've stayed at five-star and four-star hotels and they've made the mistake of drinking water out of the tap or they brought you a glass of water at the restaurant that wasn't bottled water or purified water, you found out very quickly that the same problems they had in biblical and ancient times still exist today. That was, listen carefully, this is incredibly important, don't miss it. That was the primary use of preserving the fruit of the vine. The slight fermentation process killed Giardia, Cryptosporium, parasites, bacteria, and helped to make their drinking water safe. Bullshit. 
They didn't have germ theory yet. They didn't know that putting wine in water would make it safe, even though that is true. Modern studies show that even a low concentration of wine in water proves effective at inactivating pathogens and damaging bacterial organisms. However, it takes 24 to 48 hours for the alcohol to kill the pathogens. In most cases, the water and wine were served together, and the patron was allowed to mix to his personal taste. So clearly, the intent was not to purify the water. Next, even when the water and wine were served pre-mixed, it was not done a day or two before the water was consumed. So even if they had known this effect, which they could not, that clearly was not the goal. Finally, wine was available in the Roman world in many flavors. They had wine with herbs, salt, spices, honey, capers, even cheese. Clearly, it was about taste, not about purifying the water. Also noteworthy, I had intended to make a point about purifying the water being a reason for drinking watered wine earlier, but didn't because when I read the sources I'm using, they said just the opposite, that this was not a reason for mixing water with wine. Wine mixed in the water primarily was medicinal. It was not used for social drinking. It was used to keep them healthy and to keep their kids from getting sick and people having serious stomach disorders. Bullshit. They drank wine all the time. They drank wine with every meal. They drank wine when they were thirsty. Yes, it was watered down, but they also drank a hell of a lot more of it than we do today, or at least some of us. I hold myself to one or two drinks a week. I won't even finish this for another day or two. But to claim that ancient people only drank for medicinal reasons and to purify their water that they didn't even know was contaminated is just making up what you want to be true so you can impose your moral standards on people who don't necessarily agree with your moral standards. We read about its medicinal qualities in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the wounded traveler. There by the side of the road, his wounds were treated with oil and wine. The wine was used as an antiseptic. That's true. Even though they didn't understand germs, they did realize that wounds healed better if you put alcohol on them. Wouldn't it have been better if on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would have told the people about germ theory? It would be so much more practical than the meek shall inherit the earth. Believers would have a real basis for claiming that Christianity is pro-science. But alas, Jesus never says anything that people didn't already know. And so wine in the Bible was not the party wines and the pretty wines that we often have in modern culture, it was used primarily as a medicinal application. Right. That's why there were vats of it being served to the wedding guests at the wedding at Cana. They all fell down while dancing and had boo-boos and needed tending. That's why they put herbs, spices, honey, and so forth in their wine, because they had no intention of consuming it, just pouring it on a wound. Get real. There are all kinds of beverages available to you that are healthy and much more healthy, far more healthy than any type of wine, beer, alcohol. It's not a necessity in the modern church. People that do it are doing it for recre recreational reasons. The Catholics would disagree. They believe that the use of wine in their church services for communion is an essential part of their worship. Catholic services include communion in every Mass. Protestant services have no set schedule for communion. Some do it every Sunday, some once a quarter, some once a month. But Catholics who go to Mass daily get their communion wine daily. During Prohibition, the use of wine in religious services was permitted even under Prohibition. So while I personally agree that alcohol is always recreational, some of your fellow believers would disagree. I think going to church and participating in a worship service is also recreational. It is historically and hermeneutically misleading to suggest that people using wine in Bible times is a justifiable reason for Christians using wine, beer, and alcohol today. And by correlation, just because people in Bible times condemn such things as homosexuality is no reason to condemn it today.
condemning intoxication, drunkenness. You know, the Bible says that a drunkard cannot even enter into heaven. That's serious. A drunkard cannot inherit heaven. Revelation chapter 20, I believe it's down around verse 8 or so. If there was no such thing as alcoholic beverages in Bible times, it was all watered down to the point of being non-alcoholic, then how could there be any drunkards? You might as well have a verse saying no spotted unicorns will be allowed in heaven. Have you not put together how you are contradicting your own message? The wine was prescribed by Paul as a medical potion and not for pleasure. When did Paul become a medical doctor that he can prescribe medication? I'll help you out. He isn't. Actually, Paul didn't even write 1 Timothy, so whoever wrote it could have been a doctor. But it's also unlikely that Timothy ever even saw this letter. It was written after Paul was dead, and who knows where Timothy was? For all the author knew or we know, Timothy may also have been dead. Because fermentation in the Bible represents sin. That's another study. I don't have time to unpack all of that for you today. But fermentation in the Bible is always taught as a parallel to sin. That's why the Bible says, Be ye not drunk with wine where is in excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Fermentation is always connected to sin, to carnality, and to things that are not of the Spirit. Fermentation, the making of spirits, is not connected to things that aren't of the Spirit. That's a good one. And again, if people are just drinking non-alcoholic wine in their water for purification purposes, as you claim, then how is this sin? How is this carnal? Does God want them to stop putting wine in their water so that they will die from the germs? What's wrong with your God that he wants his people sick? And so the early church understood that by not only their background in Judaism, but by the teachings of Christ, fermentation was considered sin, not only in drink, but even in bread. That's why in communion they had unleavened bread. Bullshit. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that communion is to be unleavened bread. Have you ever read your own Bible, dude? Here are the Bible verses that deal with communion. Not a single one mentions anything about the bread being unleavened. He gets this from communion being patterned after the Last Supper, which in the Synoptic Gospels takes place during the Passover. During the Passover, the Jewish people are supposed to eat only unleavened bread. But the Gospel of John has the Passover being the day after Jesus dies, in which case the bread at the Last Supper may or may not have been unleavened. The reason that unleavened bread is used is spelled out in Mosaic Law. It has nothing to do with sin. It's because the people needed to be ready to flee as soon as the coast was clear for them to get away from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So they were supposed to not wait for the bread to rise, just make unleavened bread and be ready to run as soon as God got done murdering all the firstborn in Egypt. It wasn't about ridding themselves of sin. It was about being ready to run. The Passover is celebrated yearly with Jewish people eating only unleavened bread during the week of Passover. Does this guy really not know his own Bible? Timothy was so bent against alcohol. Maybe he had an alcoholic relative. Maybe he had an al alcoholic a member of his family or was exposed to something that, that caused him to have a, a predisposed bent against alcohol. This was exactly the problem of the pastor that I mentioned in the opening. He had an alcoholic relative that left him so angry he waged a losing war on alcohol. There's nothing wrong with being passionate about what you think is right. But when you see that no one is coming with you, it might be time to rethink your position. I feel bad for this pastor. He appeared foolish in the newspapers and on the TV news. His rants got him attention, but not favor for his cause. He convinced no one. Because like this pastor, all he had was empty claims. He didn't back his claims on the evils of alcohol with facts and figures to give a person reason to think that what he had to say was true. He could easily have done that. There are evils to alcohol and drinking too much. People do die from drinking to excess and from driving drunk. Alcohol does cause damage to the unborn. Alcohol does damage your brain and liver. But on the other hand, 
people who consume small quantities of alcohol live longer. So it's a question of moderation. One thing is sure, running around with a Bible in your hand saying, modern people need to pretend they're living 2,000 years ago, isn't convincing. There is good reason to avoid alcohol, but this isn't one of them. My poor pastor wasted the only life he had pursuing a vision that was not to be. Just as this pastor, Tiff, wastes his time with poorly researched points and a poor understanding of his own Bible. If you drink, drink responsibly, so that you can live your life.